Euh, merci beaucoup à, à tout le monde qui est venu ce soir. On sait la quantité d'activités euh, qui sont offertes cette semaine à la COP. So thank you everybody for being here tonight. We know the quantity of great activity that's being offered at COP this week, but we got the best one tonight. So you chose well. <laughs> Vous avez bien choisi ce soir. Um, comme nous nous trouvons présentement dans des territoires non cédés qui ont été habités par plusieurs nations, dont les nations Kanyen Gehaga, les nations Anishinaabe, Atikamekw euh, et plusieurs autres groupes, je fais une reconnaissance de territoire pour reconnaître le, le fait que ces nations-là sont les gardiens de la manière qu'on vit ici aujourd'hui, qu'on veut respecter le territoire. Mais je tiens aussi à faire reconnaître que les reconnaissances de territoire ne devraient pas avoir lieu, car on devrait pouvoir savoir déjà quelles nations sont ici, quelles nations sont les gardiennes de ces territoires. Et malheureusement, on est encore dans ce processus de réconciliation. Alors, jusqu'à ce moment-là, je vais reconnaître et nommer le plus des nations possibles. So, I want to recognize before we start that we are on unceded indigenous lands that have been inhabited by a lot of nations, Kenyan Gehaga, Mohawks, for those who doesn't know, uh, Abenaki, Mi'kmaq, uh, Atikamekw, a lot of people came through these lands. But because of the, the fact that we are not, um, I would say, not in, in uh, an uninhabited land, we have to recognize still, but we should be knowing these facts. We shouldn't have to name the nation as a recognition. This should be knowledge. And the knowledge that they hold as land guardians should be also known. So until this process of reconciliation is done, we still have to name these nations. So just that they come back in our mind and in our heart. Alors, ce soir, je serai votre MC, votre animatrice. Mon nom, c'est Melissa Mollen Dupuis. Euh, je vis ici à Montréal depuis maintenant 20 ans, mais je viens de la communauté de Equantit sur la basse côte nord. Je suis de la nation Innu. Alors, je suis toujours très contente de pouvoir dire qu'en vivant à Montréal, j'ai appris énormément des nations hautes. Et euh, je veux euh, dire aussi que j'ai la chance de travailler auprès de la Fondation David Suzuki comme responsable de la campagne Boréal. Mais j'ai d'autres chapeaux aussi. Je suis animatrice de la première émission francophone autochtone nationale à Radio-Canada, ce qui n'est pas peu. <rire> Mais ce qui est un petit peu en retard aussi, <rire> ça devrait avoir eu lieu bien avant. Euh, et j'ai beaucoup d'autres euh, chapeaux parce qu'en tant que femme et autochtone, on doit malheureusement encore jongler avec beaucoup de problématiques au Canada. So, I'm really proud to be here tonight. I'm going to be your MC. I'm from the Inu community of Equantit, but I've been living uh, on, on this territory for around 20 years now. I'm really happy to have not learned a lot from the nations here. Um, I am also part of the team of the David Suzuki Foundation, been for four years now as the Boreal Coordinator. And also I wear another hat as uh, the first uh, radio show host for the first, uh, the first Francophone radio show host, indigenous national radio show. Okay, you get it. <laughs> It's called Kwe Kwe, that's easier, okay? but. You see how late we are in the game in Canada to have these knowledge and these, these perspective up front. So we have a lot of work to do. And today we have a panel that's been working there off <laughs> to get these knowledge up front here at the COP, but also everywhere across Canada. So I'm going to start by introducing them. I think we have, uh, I don't know if we can see uh, Severn on the live stream. Uh, but I will start with our in, uh, invitees. So uh, I will start by introducing Lucy Tulogarjuk, an award-winning actor and creative performer, and the current executive director of Nunavut Independent Television Network, NITV. You may also know Lucy uh, for her performance in the future film Atanarhuat, the Fast Runner, and too many amazing film projects to cover here. Lucy is also skilled in Uktitut translator, And we are thrilled to have her with us tonight. Uh, please welcome Lucy. <laughs> uh, since we did not choose our colonizers, I will be hopping from English to French in some of the presentation. Though, so 
uh, please understand it's not going to be like that all the evening, but just in respect of a lot of the indigenous people that have been colonized in French, <laughs> don't want to be ignored. Alors, euh, ici, je veux présenter Lucy Toulouse-Larduc, euh, qui a reçu beaucoup de récompenses et de reconnaissances pour son travail comme actrice, mais aussi comme performatrice créative. Elle est euh, présentement la directrice exécutive du Nunavut Independent Television Network, NITV, et vous la connaissez sûrement aussi pour sa performance dans le film « Hatan Nahwat, le coureur rapide » et plusieurs autres projets dans lesquels elle, elle a brillé. Et aussi, c'est une traductrice de la langue Inuktitut, et on est très, très fiers de l'avoir avec nous ce soir. Alors, c'est Lucie. J'ai l'air d'être la maman au-dessus de tout le monde, mais c'est vraiment parce que c'est un petit stage. Et je vais continuer en français pour ce moment-ci, parce que je vais introduire Miascom Sipi Flamand. Sipi est un des plus jeunes chefs élus dans sa communauté, à 32 ans, il est nouvellement élu chef de la communauté de Manawan, de la nation Atikamekw. Il est aussi titula titulaire d'un baccalauréat en sciences politiques de l'Université Laval et euh, il est aussi candidat à la maîtrise en gouvernance autochtone à l'UQAM. Tu pèses là, hein? On a des titres. So, wait till I say it in English, then you're going to get all the applause. <laughs> So, C.P. Flamand is one of the youngest elected chief in his community at 32. He's the chief of the Manawan community from the Atikamekw Nation. He's also uh, studied uh, political science at the University of Laval, and he is a candidate for the uh, master degree in govern indigenous governance at UCAT University. So, all that in, that, uh, in this young package. <laughs> And it's like I'm, I, I'm, I'm showing just excellence still. I'm going now to uh, Takaya Blaney, a 21-year-old indigenous youth and native children survivor ambassadors from the Tlahaman First Nation. She is attending COP15 alongside a delegation of indigenous youth, a land defender, to condemn destructive industrial forestry practice in BC. And she advocates for the dam removal of the Tisquat River, once the second largest salmon run in the West Coast. Uh, she has been featured in documentaries spoken at the United Nations Conference environmental event and classroom across Canada and internationally. Since the age of 10, Takaya has been vocal about the protection of land, water, climate, and work with in indigenous movement to combat extractive industry, climate change, and oil pipelines that threatens the present, future, and survival of her people. Takaya seeks to address colonialism as the root climate change and biodiversity loss to reawaken indigenous sovereignty to ensure livable future. That's a lot of work, people. <laughs> Alors là, je le fais en français. <rire> Alors, Takaya Blaney, à 21 ans, euh, est une jeune personne autochtone euh, qui est aussi une euh, Native Children Survival Ambassador de la nation Tlalmin. Euh, elle a présentement participé à la COP15 aux côtés d'une délégation de jeunes autochtones qui défendent le territoire pour condamner l'industrie forestière qui détruit présentement euh, sa communauté du BC et elle veut aussi qu'on retire le barrage de la rivière Tisquat, euh, qui a été, une, par, par le passé, une des secondes plus grandes euh, comment je peux dire, euh, rivières de frais de saumon euh, dans, en Colombie-Britannique. Euh, elle a justement euh, été, a participé à des documentaires, elle a parlé aux Nations unies, dans des conférences environnementales, dans des classes, même à travers le Canada et à l'international. Et depuis l'âge de 10 ans, Takaye euh, fait entendre sa voix pour protéger la terre, les eaux, euh, le climat et elle travaille avec des mouvements autochtones pour pouvoir combattre justement les industries extractivistes, le changement climatique et aussi euh, toutes les formes de colonialisme qui sont à la racine même des, des changements climatiques et de la perte de biodiversité. Et elle essaye aussi de raviver la souveraineté euh, autochtone pour s'assurer d'un futur vivable. I don't know if you know this guy. 
Oh, the, he gets the big guns out. So David Suzuki, first and foremost, and that's the most important title of all, he's a grandfather. So right there, <laughs> represent David. <laughs> well, you, I still got to throw you flowers a little bit. Okay, that's the guy that's basically on my paycheck every two weeks. <laughs> Because he co-founded the David Suzuki Foundation. So thank you, David, for my livelihood. <laughs> uh, but uh, David also has received much recognition, many awards. I think we can't even like go through it, uh, including a UNESCO Prize for Science, a United Nations Environmental Program Medal, and 29 honorary degrees. He's also a companion for the Order of Canada. So I think... Uh, we can listen to him, he's not talking through his hat, OK? <laughs> Alors, je voulais présenter David et il tient formellement à ce qu'on le présente par son titre le plus important, et c'est celui de grand-père. Et il a raison parce que dans nos nations, euh, c'est un des plus importants qui précède tout. Uh, I, I sometimes forget to tell people that even the queen, before we say she was the queen when she died, we said she was a grandmother. So that's how important that title is, even more than royalty. So. Um, et David a aussi reçu plusieurs prix. Uh, il a reçu des reconnaissances, justement, uh, comme le prix des sciences de l'UNESCO, uh, la médaille du programme environnemental des Nations Unies et 29 autres uh, um, diplômes honorifiques. Donc, faut l'écouter. Il parle pas à travers son chapeau. Uh, je ne sais pas si on voit Severn présentement, juste dans le live stream. OK. Est-ce qu'on... Uh, Severn, are you here? Oui, je suis là. I'm calling the spirits of Severn Suzuki. <laughs> je suis ici. Est-ce que tu peux m'entendre? Oui. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sadly, tonight, uh, Severn Suzuki... Uh, Severn Collis Suzuki, I'm so sorry, I forgot one of your names. Severn uh, Collis Suzuki could not be with us because of COVID. Ah... Uh, but she still has a lot to, to do uh, with us. Uh, so I will uh, present her. Huh? You can see her. Oh, oh, way beautiful. Do you see how powerful she is? She's making it look like she's not even sick. So that's, that's a powerful woman there. Uh, so, <laughs> Severn, I'm going to present you as well. You've been in, because uh, you've been as, as uh, as vocal as your father, but very, from a very young age, because I've known you since you were a little girl, so I followed your, your exploit, but uh, there are many. So she's been an activist for diversity in natural world and in human society since she entered the world stage speaking at the first nature COP in Rio back in 1992. She continued to work for intergenerational justice as a youth activist and has participated in several COPs and other venues. Severn is a biologist, ethnobiologist, and has been working for Ida family on language revitalization for many years. She is now uh, the David Suzuki Foundation Executive Director. Thank you, Severn, for joining us today, uh, despite uh, being ill. So just say you're looking great tonight. Alors, Severn... Yeah, he, his name is on it. She signed it, so I'm covered. I love the Suzuki family. <laughs> um, so I will, uh, I will do it in French also. Sorry, I almost forgot that bit. Alors, euh, malheureusement, Severin n'a pas pu se joindre à nous aujourd'hui car elle a malheureusement attrapé la COVID, mais elle est avec nous euh, justement de façon virtuelle. Et Severin a aussi une carrière tout aussi brillante que celle de David, mais elle a commencé beaucoup plus jeune. Euh, D'ailleurs, pour tous ceux qui s'en rappellent, elle a, été, euh, elle a été une activiste justement pour la diversité dans, la, dans le monde naturel et aussi dans la société humaine. Et elle est entrée sur le, le stage mondial en 92 quand elle a parlé à la première COP Nature à Rio. Euh, en 92, c'est ça, excusez-moi. Et elle continue à faire son travail justement de justice intergénérationnelle euh, comme une jeune activiste et elle a con continué à participer à plusieurs COP et d'autres, bien sûr, rencontres. Et Severn est une biologiste, une ethnobiologiste et elle a travaillé avec sa famille Aïda euh, pour la revitalisation de la langue pour plusieurs années. 
Alors, maintenant, elle est la directrice exécutive de la Fondation David Suzuki. Et comme David l'a dit, c'est elle qui signe les chèques euh, <rire> à toutes les deux semaines. Alors, Severne, I'm going to pass the mic to you at this moment. Merci beaucoup, Melissa. Bonjour tout le monde. Merci uh, de m'avoir présenté ainsi que, que nos merveilleuses invités. Thank you so much for introducing me and these wonderful uh, participants we have tonight, Melissa. And thank you so much, Lucy, CP, and Takaya for joining me and my dad here this evening. I'm very honored to be here. I'm, I'm so sad to be in my hotel room instead of there with you as I was planning to as I came here to to be here for um, but I'm still very honored to be participating on Gagne Gehaga territory and to be able to participate online. DSF is very honored for the speakers that we have here tonight and also for the guests that we have in the room. I think I spied in a photo that Ellen Gabriel is here and wow. <laughs> yes, and um, and Miles Richardson as well, I believe, and I'm sure there may be other um, other amazing leaders as well. So thank you so much for joining and and coming and supporting us tonight by being here. So we're here tonight. I'm uh, again. This is supposed to be a conversation. Um, so I'll just, you know, start off by saying a few words. We're here this evening during the Conference of the Parties where the world is talking about the future of biodiversity. And they're trying to set legally binding targets and international laws to protect biodiversity. And biodiversity, I mean, it's a word that really means our precious family of life on this planet. And all of us here today, tonight, are here in Montreal to put pressure on the decision makers for those targets and laws to actually mean something. I'm honored to share space tonight with Lucy, CP, and Taikaya, who are Indigenous activists who fight for the earth and for future generations. Also with my father, David, it's always an honor to be with you in an event because we are in this fight together. And That's part of the theme tonight. I've learned, my father and I together have shared this learning from Indigenous friends and families that there's power in standing with your relatives. There's power in standing with your elders and with your children. And that's what the environmental movement needs to do to make environmental change. That's what the Canadian public needs to do to, to push for environmental change. All the generations need to work together. We all need to work together towards conserving biodiversity, which is actually our family, our kin. And so tonight, the themes that we're representing and talking about here are how the different generations play a role in this fight together, and also how Indigenous and non-Indigenous allies can work together towards a common future for our children. Justice for future generations has been my lifelong mission. And now as I'm studying anthropology, I'm studying my own culture and realizing that our globalized culture has forgotten that sacred duty of maintaining justice for our children, maintaining the earth so that our children can inherit it in a good way. And I went to Rio in 1992 as a child to remind the negotiators, those men in power, in power of what was truly at stake. And now I'm a mother and I'm here for my children. In every generation, there are always youth warriors. There were many other youth activists back then and many since, and they continue to play a key role in speaking truth to power because youth have everything at stake. So I'm very interested in what you here have been experiencing at the COP. I'm very interested to hear how you're feeling about what is happening at these events, what is happening behind closed doors, what is happening in the streets. I know some of you are veterans of UN gatherings. In fact, I met Takaya at Rio Plus 20, which was in 2012 in Rio de Janeiro and meeting you Takaya 
uh, as well as Shateska Martinez. That was the highlight of that gathering for me. It was, it was so powerful for me. And you were 11 years old. So I want to hear about how you're feeling about these meetings today, what the problems with it are, and where you think the biggest potential is for us to crack this system open. Now I will hand it over to uh, David to say to uh, say a few words. Merci. Uh, J'habite à Vancouver, Colombie Britannique, où uh, nous ne parlons pas français. Malheureusement, je ne suis pas uh, je ne suis pas bilingue et je vais parler en anglais. Excusez-moi. Uh, I'm glad to have this opportunity. Thank you for that introduction, Severn. And I, I know it's about intergenerational justice, but I wanted to explain, give you some background on why, since its inception in 1990, Miles was a part of the founding of the David Suzuki Foundation. Indigenous, the indigenous presence, and uh, has been critical to the way that our foundation has uh, done its work. And I just wanted to explain why. I spent, after I graduated from high school in London, Ontario, I spent eight years in the United States getting my education. And I came back to Canada in 1962, and man, I was hot. I was going <laughs> to make my reputation as a hotshot geneticist, and uh, a woman just smacked me in the head. Now, this has happened to me all my life, but uh, in yeah. this case, I'm one of my great... Uh, sadness is that I never met her. But in 1962, as I was beginning my career in genetics, uh, Rachel Carson published Silent Spring. And as I read that book, it was just like a, a smack in the head. As I realized, you know, scientists are great at focusing on a part of nature, concentrating it on it. This is called reductionism, where you look at the elementary parts on the assumption that you'll be able to fit them all together again and explain the whole. Well, I don't have time to explain why this just doesn't work. But for me, as a biologist reading that, I realized when you study insects in a test tube or a growth chamber, and then you grow some plants and treat it with uh, DDT, that's not a study of nature. It's an artifact. It's a grotesque simplification of the real world. And when you study nature that way, you cannot anticipate what the long-term consequences are going to be in the real world. Because in the real world, everything is connected to everything else. When you isolate, separate, and focus, you can't see those interconnections. And so when DDT began to be used in, in huge quantities, uh, the, the man who discovered that uh, DDT kills insects won a Nobel Prize in 1948. We thought, great. But only years later, we discovered biomagnification up the food chain. You concentrate DDT hundreds of thousands of times, and because DDT is lipophilic, it likes to go to fatty tissue, concentrates in the shell glands of birds and in the breasts of women. So women become the canary in the coal mine because the fatty tissue in breasts is attractive to DDT, PCBs, dioxin, all of these big ring compounds are lipophilic. And so that was the beginning of my career in the environmental movement. And at that time in 1962, I thought the problem is simple. Humans are taking too much stuff out of our surroundings and putting too much waste and junk back into it. So we were lobbying governments. We said, we need laws to regulate how much and what we can take from the environment, how much and what we can put back in. And we've got to enforce the regulations. But I quickly realized we don't know enough to do that. How can you possibly, how could we have set limits on DDT when we didn't know about biomagnification until eagles began to disappear? And then scientists tracked down the brand new phenomenon we didn't know anything about. And so that was a dilemma for me um, as I was swept up in the movement. And uh, it was in 1980, when we decided to do a film about the fight over logging in Haida Gwaii, that I met the Haida for the first time. Miles was one of the first people I met, and uh, one, one was his, his companion, Gujao. These were 
people fighting against the logging in their communities, even though they were desperate for jobs and many of the loggers were Ida. And so I asked Guja, why are you fighting against the logging? When the, you're, a, you're an artist, it doesn't, what difference does it make to you? And he said, well, of course, we'll still be here when the trees are gone, but then we'll just be like everybody else. And I didn't understand what he meant by that until I thought about it days later and I realized he was telling me that he sees the world in a fundamentally different way, that there is no separation, that he doesn't end at his skin or his fingertips, that being Haida, who he is, is dependent on the air, the water, the soil, the trees, the birds, the fish, all of that is what make the Haida who they are, and indigenous people all over the world are attached in the same way to their place. And so that began a total change in the way I looked at the problem, and this year is the 30th anniversary of the, public, uh, the republication of my book, The Sacred Balance, Rediscovering Our Place in Nature. And that book was brought about because of the work I did with the Haida on their battle over logging in Windy Bay. What does that mean then? It means that we have to look at the world in a, a very, very different way. And the problem today is that the for 500 years, we have been homogenizing the planet with a single notion of resourcism, looking at Earth as if it's full of resources. We've changed uh, from being as we, we felt for most of human existence. We've always known we were in a web. We were one strand in a web of relationships with all other species of animals, with plants, with air, water, soil, and sunlight. That's the way we've always been for most of human history. But then we began to get this idea that, oh, we're different. We're not, we're, we live in a pyramid, not a, a web. In a pyramid, we're at the top and everything down below is for us. And environmentalism is just, oh, we gotta be a little more careful. That's all it's saying. But fundamentally, we have created our institutions, our legal, our economic, and our political institutions, all based on the notion that we are at the top of a pyramid, and it's all about us. What indigenous people represent is a worldview, a perspective that is fundamentally different, that sees there is no separation, that in our, the web in which we live, everything is connected to everything else. And so when you begin from that perspective, everything changes. So uh, that's the setting in which I hope we will hear from the, the real people here, the, uh, the panel members here, uh, some background. Thank you very much. Janishka Mitten, means thank you, uh, David. And I was, just want to say after such a speech, I can say you're as hot as in the 60s. <laughs> But to start, uh, before we start our conversation, because that's basically what we want to hear, you all figuring out uh, between each other these issues that we were trying to bring forward, like solutions from coming from indigenous communities and people, I want to have at least one vision from each of our participants about how they're living through this COP, the COP 15, because it's been, uh, I think, as uh, insightful, but also as problematic for a lot of indigenous people. So I will start with Lucy to ask of you what has been your experience so far about COP 15. Alors je demande à Lucy de nous partager, ah merci Lucy, de nous partager justement sa vision euh, de comment elle vit présentement la, la COP 15 parce que ça a été aussi euh, très... Euh, on y a vu une vision claire de ce qui se passe pour les premiers peuples, mais aussi euh, on se pose encore des questions sur son efficacité à la COP15. Ranora. Lucy, vous avez vu que 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 vous avez vu I'm Lucy, originally from Igloolik Nunavut. I thank you, David, for recognizing the Haida Nation and 
learning from the indigenous people when you say we um when oftentimes it's in the triangle form the humans are in the top and but i appreciate you when you recognize that the indigenous and including inuit perspective is we are equal um whether we're it's bird form fish uh, four-legged animals from the land any mammal in the water the air the uh, everything that surrounds us um so thank you it's often interesting to see that um when i was a kid we would have uh watch you on tv and as a teenager when i first met you um, um my friend and i were thrilled to see we saw a real biologist a scientist that's on tv never knowing that um, i would be here with you today so thank you everyone for coming here to to hear what we have to say or what we know of uh, of our culture and or um, knowledge and um, yeah I'm suddenly stage fright so <laughs> um, in Inuit perspective uh, I've always known from childhood to observe. I would be uh, first thing in the morning, my mother would tell me to go outside and observe what's the weather like. And I would have to give a, um, uh, tell her how the cloud is, how if there's a fog, if there's a rain, or um, so we were learned, taught to observe around our environment at a very young age and we were also taught to respect the animals that we eat because it's giving us its permission to eat it to live and eventually we will be back to the earth and the insects would eat our body so it's a cycle of life and since we were little that is what we were taught so when people say take what you need and leave what you don't need that's still practiced in inuit communities um, we believe in our culture that if you take revenge to the animals and or the planet it the co the karma comes back to you so in fear Inuit would avoid that um, neglecting or uh, disrespecting animals because it can always come back to you or your child or grandchildren. So that is what I've learned and that is what I teach my children and it is still practiced today. I was telling my friend, um, I'm not a scientist, but I've observed and learned and I feel that when my parents were my teachers, they were my biologists, they were my scientists. They may not have got the degree or big recognition, but in my eyes, they were the scientists. They were my survival teachers. And I absolutely love my parents and grandparents before them for surviving uh, they were near starvation and but they believed in hope and they believed in respecting the land they believed in respecting animals um i'm here and i now have grandchild too and i love my children thank you Lucy. Euh, merci, Lucy. Euh, je vais, pour la prochaine partie, faire la traduction pour CP à l'anglais. Uh, because uh, of the next part, I will be translating. CP, who's going to be speaking mainly in French, 
to English uh, in respect to the fact that I believe a lot of people here understand English, but I really want to make sure that the Francophone voice is heard and it's often an issue for Eastern situated community. Uh, we feel isolated by uh, the fact that we were not colonized by the same people. So our second language, sometimes even our first language is French and we don't often get to connect with our Anglophone speaking relatives. So, alors, en respect pour le fait qu'on n'a pas choisi nos colonisateurs et que souvent, en tant qu'Autochtones de la côte Est, euh, on se sent souvent isolé du fait qu'on a appris le français et que ça ne nous permet pas de parler euh, directement avec nos, nos relations de l'Ouest. Euh, je vais faire la traduction pour Sipi à mesure qu'il va parler. Donc, euh, merci beaucoup pour votre écoute. Quick, quick, skin, I did now, and I made a ten, one me to go cut down, not so haga. Can just cut out Nanoka, Mozaga de Caski, I was his cake skin, Ramadism, Gaki, Kadaskinak, Tawak Sartaguno Haga, Car Mozaga de Kilde, El Tibrio, Keltiok, and Yon Ruizuk, Mugot the Grand Dog, like Moyga with Bimgek, Kawar of that Sukano, Ewit Kik. Thank you to, to share us your knowledge, your history, your Expertise. <laughs> Thank you. Ben, pour ma part, euh, bon, bonjour tout le monde. Je me, me nomme Sibi Flama, je suis un mec de la communauté de Manawan où je suis également chef. Pour ma part, ce qu'on discute aujourd'hui ici, puis depuis euh, une semaine environ, la biodiversité, la, la protection de la biodiversité, c'est ce que nos ancêtres ont, ont protégé depuis des siècles, depuis euh, qu'ils sont en rapport, en relation avec l'environnement, avec la terre-mère. C'est aussi important d'établir ce rapport-là pour pouvoir maintenir la vie sur terre. So, our ancestors, the Atikamek, uh, have been connected to the relationship to the land and to also the animals for time immemorial. So, uh, in what we are speaking at the COP right now, it's important to create and to re, re, uh, replace, put it back in its place, these relationships that exist. Je crois que dans, dans ces discussions-là, là, cette conversation ici va nous amener à, à aller beaucoup plus loin en écoutant les communautés autochtones, en mettant de l'avant leur philosophie euh, sur le rapport sacré qu'ils ont avec euh, le territoire. So by having this discussion, we're going to put back in place the sacred relation that indigenous community have with the, the living beings on this territory. De plus, dans, dans ce qu'on parle de, 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 du rapport que les autochtones ont avec le, leur territoire, la terre-mère, on parle aussi de l'aspect politique, de l'aspect philosophie pour rétablir, revitaliser leur mode de gouvernance, leur manière d'interagir avec toutes les espèces qui existent dans leur territoire. So not only are we talking about the perspective of the relationship between indigenous people and the land, but we're also bringing forward the philosophical and political uh, knowledge that comes with these relationships and also the right to self-governance and to self-determination of indigenous people, but from an indigenous perspective. C'est dans ces discussions-là aussi que, tu sais, ce qu'on qu vit dans les communautés, on nous a imposé une manière de faire, une manière d'agir, euh, la colonisation qui nous a impacté socialement, politiquement, économiquement. In, uh, and, I'm going to say in French. <laughs> and now we can see uh, the impacts of what has been imposed on us. Uh, might it be political system, school system, and we see the consequences of this, uh, this colonization on us. Aujourd'hui, on, on tente de travailler, retravailler sur la revitalisation de nos modes de gouvernance, de nos philosophies, pour pouvoir dire que nous sommes encore présents sur, sur nos territoires, que nous voulons protéger ces territoires-là, pas seulement pour, euh, pour dire que c'est notre territoire, mais on veut le protéger pour les prochaines générations. And now we're really working at the revitalization of 
those philosophical and those self-governance uh, ways of doing because we want we don't just want to claim that these are our territories we also want to be able to be living on them for the seven next future generations au cours de la dernière année la nation atikamekw ben la communauté atikamekw de manawan s'est mobilisée en mettant en place un moratoire euh, contre les coupes forestières. So in the last couple of months, the uh, community of Manawan, which, uh, to which he is now uh, been uh, newly elected chief, has been mobilizing around a moratorium uh, around uh, forest and logging, uh, forest cutting and logging uh, around the community. Cette politique-là, ben, la politique qu'on a adoptée s'inscrit dans dans les traditions juridiques à Dikmeuk Nourizio pour s'assurer une continuité culturelle de nos membres, de nos, de nos jeunes sur le territoire. And this process has been uh, recorded as being in line with the Atikamek Nourizio uh, way of doing to make sure that the youth can still access culturally and physically the territory. Jusqu'à maintenant, le gouvernement du Québec n'a pas voulu reconnaître euh, le mécanisme qu'on a pris pour euh, protéger nos territoires. And right up to now, the Quebec government has not recognized the uh, mechanism we put in place to protect our territories. Nous maintenons quand même la pression au gouvernement et aussi aux compagnies forestières de, de reconnaître nos droits, mais aussi de d'appliquer les savoirs avec Mac Nourizio sur euh, la protection du territoire, mais aussi si on parlerait aussi d'aménagement territorial. Là. And we've been applying the, uh, the the pressure on the government, also uh, the industry, to respect the Etika Mac Nourizio uh, way of doing uh, and practicing and protecting the territory. Mais c'est encore des des longues discussions politiques euh, à faire avec eux, donc euh, c'est euh, je suis là pour ça. <laughs> and he's here because they're still talking and there's it's still a lot of work to do to make them uh, recognize and apply these uh, ways of doing that the community have decided on. Donc c'est ce qu'on discute ben ce qu'on fait avec le territoire à Manawan, je pense que ça va créer aussi un mouvement dans d'autres communautés autochtones. Par exemple, les Anishinaabe qui ont, qui se sont mobilisés, qui ont demandé un moratoire sur la protection de, de l'orignal. Ça, c'est des ressources qui maintiennent no notre identité culturelle en vie. Puis cela va de soi par rapport à nos territoires aussi. And all that's been done by the Atikamek uh, Nation also echoes through what's being done with the Anishinaabe Nation that has put a moratorium on the uh, hunting of moose on their own territory, which are neighbor territories and neighbor, neighboring nations. So uh, it, it talks about all the work that's being done uh, to, uh, res for the to have to be understood by the government for self-determination. Miigwech. Merci. Thank you. Miigwech. <laughs> J'espère que j'ai pu traduire assez fidèlement tes mots et je m'excuse euh, s'il y a des, des, des pensées que j'ai pas réussi à traduire le, le, plus, le, le plus justement possible. C'est pour ça que j'ai écrit un livre. <laughs> yeah, he wrote a book on, on, on the perspective, on political perspective of indigenous people. And I think it's going to be a big success because they're going to reprint it. And it's just been out right now, like, même pas un mois. Like a month ago, he got that book out. So uh, it's very, uh, he's very much involved in the respect of indigenous perspective in politics and uh, the right to self-determinate. Uh, so now I'm going to turn around uh, to Takaya. And uh, Takaya, I think you have a lot of perspective on what's happening right now at COP15. So uh, I will ask you very humbly to share that vision coming from a youth that had done so much in the, the couple of last years. Ajichipot, Cheche Athich, for having me here. Chikajimuk, Dance. My ancestral name is Chikajimuk. I'm from the village of Tishosam. I'm from the Tlaaman Nation. My Kukpa, my grandfather, is Robert Blaney, and my Chichia, my grandmother, is Elizabeth Blaney. And I traveled here with some of my relatives, uh, some of my cousins from our community as well as our sister nation, 
to speak the truth about the extractive violence being enacted against our homelands by the Canadian government. And to ensure that our lands are not being sanctioned as a sacrifice zone in these international negotiation spaces that put our birthright on the table. I've been at United Nations forums, as Severin mentioned, since the age of 10 years old. And I got involved because of the work of my family in resisting mechanisms, colonial mechanisms to extinguish our, our, our governance, our, our traditional ways of holding power and making decisions in our community. And I grew up in those courtrooms um, and I'm watching my elders have to put their bodies on the line and, and blockade, as well as the mobilizations around Idle No More, Northern Gateway, uh, in person missing the ways that our communities rise up and draw the line because we have to instilled a very deep sense of responsibility and modeled for me the fight that our young people are stepping into now that we will have to carry for our next generation with hope that the next generation will have to carry less. But it is necessary because what we're talking about in COP15 or when we go back home and carry that work out as Indigenous people in our own communities is, is the right of countless future generations beyond ourselves to exist. And I think that being within these spaces from a very young age has created a, a very deep clarity around what they represent and who they are for. I have witnessed climate negotiations take place for a decade now. <laughs> and what I've witnessed is the desperate attempt to salvage global economies rooted in extraction. I've witnessed the negotiation of trade agreements from colonial nation states who are responding to the climate crisis by trying to commodify nature with nature-based solutions, which is an attempt to replicate our indigenous systems of being while fundamentally misunderstanding what is at the root of our knowledge systems. And I find that indigenous knowledge is such a hot commodity in these spaces, but I don't even think that these settlers know what they're grasping at. And I'm sorry to say that it's more simple than you think. I'm sorry to say that it's not a key that's going to unlock our lands for you. It's the very simple understanding that we are a part of nature. The very thing that emboldened colonizers to enact genocide against our people was the belief that we were not human beings. Why did they think we weren't human beings? Because we were connected to the land. And their way of life is built on disconnection, is built on dominion over nature, and that is what they believe makes them special, what makes them entitled to all land. Um, so as, as a young person showing up with other young people from my community in a space where there's politicians, where there's policymakers, where there is scientists, I think that we are often encouraged to, to be silent as Indigenous people. Um, 
unless we are using colonial language. And it's really hard to maintain your truth. Um, it's really easy to get convinced that there's just something that you're not seeing because these spaces are so dysfunctional. They're so alienating. They're so uncomfortable. And as Indigenous people, we're very familiar with that feeling because that's how we are made to feel walking through colonial worlds. And then we are told it is your fault that you feel uncomfortable. It is your fault that you don't understand. It's because you're not as intelligent. So something I told my cousins when they were bringing those feelings to me was, no, 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 you feel that way because you know what it is to be connected. You know what it is to care for land and to relate to land, and they don't. And so if you have a sense that this is wrong, then that is a gift. And that is what they are grasping at. Um, so as far as COP15, just you know, <laughs> wrapping up uh, this, this sentiment here, um, I feel like the solutions, as far as, as Indigenous solutions go, are ending extractive capitalism, are ending colonialism. We cannot lead as Indigenous peoples if we are constantly under siege. And that's what we came here to say. We came here to, to fight against the industrial logging practices, to try and get the dam of our river removed so future generations can have salmon. And if what we're met with is, oh, but if we do that, how are we supposed to continue to make money? <laughs> if we do that, how are we supposed to power the rest of the world? If we do that, how are we supposed to feed the rest of the world? I think you are misunderstanding that this is not your land. So let's start there. Let's start with sovereignty. Because people will say that word a lot, but they don't know what it means. It is about belonging, it is about future, and it is about the fact that colonialism has never offered our people anything more than our land has offered us for thousands of years before that. So that is what we are trying to get back to. That is what we are trying to fight for. Um, yeah, <laughs> so, so listen to the only people who've survived here for thousands of years. Thank you. I gotta say, Takaya, uh, damn. <laughs> this is like perfect, like uh, it's the perfect gateway to the discussion of intergenerational conversation we wanna have because I'm like, uh, and I just wanna like acknowledge that when I was your age, I was like, I didn't feel the right to say land back because I couldn't believe people would like listen. It's not even a concept I would ac access because we, we were so told we would, we were like, like savages we were not intelligent and it, it was something that was drilled into us and just fighting that on my generation that was a, a, the fight of that time and i'm looking at your generation and you're woke in a good way in a good woke way okay <laughs> so i I, fi I find that as we're growing because david shared what he lived through uh, uh reading on this uh the silent spring and I was like, that, oh, that, yeah, I heard about that book. It was history. It was before, and then you're not that old. <laughs> but I'm like, seeing that cross across generation and seeing how we pass the flame, but it's getting brighter and brighter as we're going to the future. It, it is, for me, very encouraging, even though the danger is growing as well. So I want to turn again to uh, Severn. I hope, I'm calling Spirit. Severn Spirit, are you still here? <laughs> Yeah, yes. Yes, <laughs> we love I'm to talk here. to spirits. <laughs> Spirit world is here. Severin, I want to talk to you because this week we celebrated your speech at the Rio uh, meeting. And I was, I was telling my, my friends that that's, that speech has not grown old, you know? It could have been told this year as well. And I, I'm feeling that since you met also Takaya at 
the, the, the cop in the cop setting. Don't you feel sometimes that the, the, this intergenerational passing of the baton can be tiring, can be, uh, uh, the, the, I would say, um, discouraging? Well, I don't see it that way. Um, when I met Takaya at COP, I was very jaded. I'd, I'd stopped wanting to go to COPs. I mean, first of all, I just want to say how moved I am by Takaya's words. And I know everybody in that room can feel the power of what she just shared with us. And, you know, that is a very special and powerful thing. And, and that power really often you hear it in the voices of youth because youth have everything at stake and they can see so clearly, you know, without all the rationalization that people use, you know, what is happening. And, you know, when I met Takaya at uh, COP plus 20 or a real plus 20, you know, I was quite jaded and I, you know, I, I, I met her and, and she was there with Shateska who was also very young and, um, they were telling me their experience of COP and it was very much like, or of, of the summit, it was very much like what Takaya just described, you know, how crazy it was, the sponsors like Brass Can, you know, these energy companies sponsoring this environmental summit, you know, all the garbage that, that was there, you know, the, the just so much of the opposite of what you'd think an environmental gathering would be as a young person when you go to these things. And then when you go there, it's just so shocking. And so they were, you know, these children telling me and I started to cry because of course by then I was quite jaded I knew what I knew what these conferences were like and and they started to comfort me they started to comfort me they just said you know it's no no we're gonna do it there's so many amazing people we've met so many people who are doing incredible work and they're fighting for our voices to be heard and they're fighting for future generation. We're going to make it. We're going to make it. And it was such a powerful moment for me as a veteran, you know, activist and um, to have these children comforting me. And so we can't pass the baton. We have to share it. We have to work together and we have to help each other do this together because you can feel the power in the room right now for us actually working together towards this. No generation can do it alone. And, you know, our modern society has fragmented us. It's, capitalism has frag fragmented us because it's better for people to be isolated. So all our ages are now separated and, you know, classes are for, you know, you have 11 year olds and 12 year olds and, you know, everybody's separated out. But when you're back in community and where I've been living with my Haida family for the past 16 years, everybody's all together. It's elders and little children and babies and everybody takes care of each other. Everybody knows how to be friends with each other and learn from each other. And there's so much strength, not only in how we can help the world, but also in knowing who we are and feeling connected and in a web of, of identity. And I've never felt that except now, you know, being part of, of my Haida family. And that's a, that's a great privilege for me as a settler. So we have, um, so we have a long way to go. And I think, I think that you can, you can hear how important it is for us to reach and do this together. So I don't see it as passing the baton. I see it as reaching across and holding each other's hands. And that's why I joined the David Suzuki foundation, because I wanted to work with David and I wanted to work with also with the youth and help them use whatever, you know, whatever we had to try to help raise up the voice of young people because they are truly, they can tell us the truth and they know what we have to do. Thank you. Thanks, Seb. Uh, I gotta say, uh, Takai, you said something that really resonated with me and, uh, about the experience I've lived through the COP. It's my first COP. I went to the permanent forum many times uh, on indigenous issues, but first COP. And when you said that you felt that indigenous knowledge was our hot commodity, I think I felt it too, because some people understood what that meant, like, like profoundly understood it, but other people were like, indigenous knowledge or indigenous leadership. 
And I, I feel that it's not understood to the level it should be understood. So I wanted to pass that idea to somebody who is in a leadership position, but not just as a, a chief, just not because he got elected, but also because he's in a leadership uh, for the, the, the safety of his nation. The Atikimek Nation in Quebec is one that has the healthiest language held by the community. I think it's 90% uh, and more of the communities that speaks Atikamek Nero Wizo. And it's a, a language that is surrounded by other nations. It's three big communities, but it's a, a big territory and it's very much desired by either forestry or uh, mining. So in that idea of indigenous knowledge, knowing the language, knowing the land, uh, and having the solution to heal yourself I think, uh, CP, it's, it, it is a perspective that you're trying to put forward. And do you feel that the COP uh, process or even the, in, the recognition right now of indigenous knowledge is really something that's been put really forward or is it just superficially understood? Ben, je pense que, tu sais, les savoirs autochtones, les connaissances autochtones, c'est pas où, euh, on veut pas une reconnaissance esthétique de cette de ces savoirs-là. Ce sont des savoirs qui ont été transmis de, de plusieurs générations jusqu'à maintenant. Puis comment on doit protéger ces savoirs-là aussi? Oui, c'est de l'enseigner dans nos communautés pour pouvoir perpétuer ces savoirs-là. C'est un mode de vie qui dans lequel nous sommes. Si so, on parle, just, just, si on parle hey, de, hey, give me a second. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good, but not that good. <laughs> so, uh, the, yes, we want to have the recognition of indigenous knowledge to be happening, but not in a superficial, uh, aesthetical way. Really, as a way to bring back the language classes uh, to to have these knowledge being transmitted in a real way in our community. Yeah. <laughs> <rire> bon. Ah oui. <rire> ouais. Tu sais, la nation du Kamek qui est genre euh, ces trois communautés euh, qui sont dans le territoire. On est quand même éloigné des du milieu urbain malgré que Manouane c'est à trois heures de route d'ici mais c'est quand même assez loin. C'est euh, on a une, une belle route euh, qui nous protège. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, we we are three communities, and but we are uh, so we're close together, but not that close. And there's a beautiful road that protects us. And I'm laughing because I went to his community, and it, it is uh, quite a dangerous road. <laughs> so uh, it, it 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 gives you a perspective of how uh, you if you want to go to Manawan, it's because you really want to go to Manawan. Parce <laughs> que. <laughs> C'est la, la manière que que nous avons préservé notre langue, c'est aussi euh, en étant en territoire, puis euh, en enseignant aussi notre langue euh, dans nos écoles. Mais il euh, faut dire aussi que c'est dans un programme euh, pédagogique, comment je pourrais appeler ça, un programme pédagogique qui a été traduit, ben un programme pédagogique du Québec qui a été traduit dans la langue atikamekw. So we we do want to have our our culture so how we do is we practice on the land a lot but also we we uh, we teach atikamekw nero wizo in the school but it's it still is a school program from the Québec uh, government that has been translated in atikamekw. Et depuis euh, les années 80, ils ont implanté des, des semaines culturelles où les familles vont en territoire pour euh, enseigner ces savoirs-là auprès des jeunes. So, uh, since the 80s, in these communities, uh, we have what we call cultural weeks. It is weeks, I think that here it's uh, la relâche scolaire, it's um, winter breaks. And, but we are also, il y a hiver et automne, hein? So in the fall and in the spring, you get one week off at school so that the children can go with their family on the land to practice their traditions. Puis depuis quelques années, nous avons euh, ad adopté, ben, adapté 
une école en territoire avec euh, le projet qu'on appelle Madigan qui vise à amener les jeunes en territoire, euh, réapprendre leur, leur culture, réapprendre euh, les légendes, les mythes, les pratiques avec les aînés. And also they have a program in the school that's called Motegan, and it's to bring the kids on the land uh, during school hours to learn the legends, to learn the practice. And I think it's a model that also exists in many other uh, in many of the nations here in Quebec uh, to like to learn how to uh, skin, like for example, a seal. Vous autres savez de l'orignal, so for them it's going to be the moose. So it is uh, in the school curriculum. C'est un un projet de de recherche avec une université qu'on fait, mais avec la collaboration de Tourisme Manawan pour euh, assurer une continuité culturelle chez nos jeunes, mais aussi euh, tenter, mais pas tenter, <rire> amener des, euh, des touristes dans la communauté pour voir euh, une autre manière de faire euh, l'économie, genre de l'écotourisme qui respecte l'environnement, qui respecte euh, notre identité culturelle, nos pratiques. And it's also a collaboration that, that has been built between a university and the uh, tourism uh, center of Manawan that is to build the program. And it's also uh, also being built in with tourism to Manawan to bring people to come and see what's being done in the community uh, around the, pract the traditional practices. Au cours des deux dernières années, euh, il y a eu des formations, des ateliers sur le leadership, sur euh, l'environnement, euh, oui, le leadership selon euh, le, la perspective autochtone, puis euh, l'environnement en conversation, en dialogue avec les aînés. And also there's been conversation around uh, the dialogue between environment, uh, sorry, the dialogue on environment between our nation and even the elders has been, uh, has been uh, requested. It's also because um, as you hear what CP is talking about, you see how interconnected all these programs and these activities in the community are, but when they are presenting these perspectives to governments, it's always in a silo. School is for school, uh, tourism is for tourism, and in the uh, the indigenous perspective that's being held by the Atigamek for the moment, it's really a way of connecting all these systems to make them more uh, efficient. So you don't have to de-double, de uh, the efforts that are being asked in community for these programs by the government, because you have to do uh, reporting for the financing of it. So, so it's really mm -hmm. Si on fait ces démarches-là, c'est pour pouvoir euh, amener un leadership, euh, une jeunesse atikamek dans un autre stade politique. So if we're doing this, it's also to be creating leadership and practice of leadership uh, in the uh, indigenous, in the atikamek youth uh, groups in their communities. Jusqu'à maintenant, il y a certains jeunes qui qui vise à aller faire des études, soit en, euh, au niveau politique, soit en, en, en environnement. C'est euh, vrai que ces jeunes-là sont en train de finir leur euh, secondaire, mais ils, ils développent des, euh, des compétences là, euh, scientifiques. So the result of all this is that a lot of the youth in the community have developed competency uh, through these, these activities, and now they are aiming to go to post-secondary school in either politics or even environment. Et si on fait un, un parallèle avec les discussions avec euh, la COP15 euh, sur euh, la protection de la biodiversité, je pense que c'est aussi dans ces perspectives-là qu'il faut... Euh, investir euh, sur euh, la reconnaissance des, des droits autochtones, sur euh, les savoirs autochtones, les mettre en valeur pour pouvoir euh, changer de paradigme là, au niveau euh, politique, économique, social et juridique. And to conclude, uh, that's why we, I think we need to, in, in, in uh, reflection of the COP15, we need to invest in political uh, development of the youth uh, and also to uh, develop their capacity. We are, had discussed that uh, previously in another discussion. It's also the fact that we were not taught 
or the Indian Act. We were not taught indigenous rights. Uh, the less you know about these issues that are over your head, the more they win. So that's why he is invested in having uh, the, the indigenous youth being politically savvy, just so that they defend themselves against these government, uh, governmental uh, issues, but also that they are politically savvy, but in an indigenous perspective and traditional perspective. <laughs> we had that conversation around his book at the Place des Arts. That's why uh, I'm permitting myself to add on to what he was saying. <laughs> I'm not talking for him. I'm not like, uh, <laughs> but he's saying that. Mais merci CP. Thank you CP. Uh, and it's an important, uh, very important knowledge because this is a community that is at the center of Quebec, so it's being attacked on all sides. But there was also a community that was friend with almost all nations. They were they are known as a friendly uh, people. I know it because I really like the Atikamek, and they have always been welcoming and friendly. And that's a, a, an advantage when you're being uh, attacked by a government, when you know that these people are more welcoming than, uh, than uh, egregious. It, it's uh, they want to uh, they want to get along with people and that's that's been I've seen that being one of the point of the attack because they're sweet they're really nice <laughs> I love them uh, but I want to talk a little bit I, I want to go up north right now uh, with you Lucia <laughs> she's like oh no <laughs> <laughs> um, because we are having a lot of perspective here out east we're lucky it's in Quebec for us we we feel that this the discussion has been forced upon Quebec which sometimes the benefit of being ignored on some issue. And a lot of the issues that are very out public uh, is a lot of uh, the Western and BC, the Wet'suwet'en that we've he heard on the bigger news. But I feel that often being up north, uh, these issues that we talk at COP15 are, are often invisibilized because of the distance that your community and other communities up north uh, have of being distant and of being hard to uh, travel to and to get the message across. Uh, do you feel often that these, these instants forget about the northern uh, issues of environmental uh, um, biodiversity loss? Yes, I think that oftentimes the Arctic is forgotten or ignored. I started working for NITV because it's nonprofit and in the perspective of Inuit voice, using Inuit voice to inform Inuit and non-Inuit what is happening in the North. Recently, um, I was asking um, the lady who asked me to sit up here, why choose me? And I, she said, well, you talk to elders, you talk to youth and you also talk back to the government. And since I was a youth, I was involved in youth uh, committees and representing our community in different conferences. And so as I got older, I got less, um, I had more self-esteem, I believe, to say, to speak back, and when one of our MP for Nunavut was trying to get um, spoken to by Inuit from Inuit, tell the government such and such, and the government had a bigger power to convince this lady what they were doing to our community in seismic testing was okay and it's safe. And a lot of Inuit were saying, well, we live here, we hear these. You cannot tell us that it's not uh, impacting our waters. And Inuit were saying, yes, it is. One time we were seal hunting and uh, we hear this loud, me, uh, out of nowhere and I asked the hunters that were with me what is that we don't know but it's under the water and around that time 
I was asked if I wanted to drum dance to our MP and I told the chief where I was living at the time, I will think about it. And the next day she called, will you perform for your MP for Nunavut? So I felt, and I followed my gut and I said, well, a lot of Inuit are trying to get her attention and speak for Inuit. And it was not happening. So I said no to perform. And I got a letter from one of the top people at the parliament. How could you say no to a person who is representing you? And I said, well, how could she say no to the pers people that she is representing? So it is oftentimes trying to be flipped. And again, recently, uh, the Inuit in our area in Baffin region, there's five communities, six communities, but five are being recognized. Uh, there is an iron mine that's close to our Baffin. It is in Baffin Island. And for since 2012, NITV has been covering the, the technical hearings and these hearings have happened in 2012, 2015, up to uh, recently this uh, February, January, February in 2022. And Nunavut Impact Review Board is um, hosting these events and people from selected communities are invited and the mining company goes to communities very short notice and whether they're five people, 10 people, they'll say the community said so and so. And so we started airing these events that were happening because not a lot of big broadcasters were airing them. So. NITV Zachrise Kunuk started airing these in our community and eventually we were able to get national level and we were airing the broadcasting in January 2021 and up to the latest one. And so once we were airing these events, people were starting to pay attention to what was happening more so than before, because when I would go home and ask youth, do you know what's happening in this Baffin land? Most of the time it was not the case. Are these being taught to you in school? No, it's not being taught to us. And then I would go ask the elders, do you know what's happening in our Baffin land? No, they don't. And if they did, they were either misinformed or informed with minimal information and on the other end of the table they were saying we are informing these people but a lot of majority of the small communities speak in Uktitut and English as a second language and so and our internet is very slow it's not even funny and these reports that they put up on their website are so many pages and they tell us, we translated them and you do the research and only a majority of those 400 something pages are translated. So um, the big companies like to say, yes, we are informing people, but are they really informing people? Are they telling the truth? And are they only uh, getting these informations from five people and they say, well, the community said. So it's often the case in our communities in Nunavut that um, they'll count a handful, but they will say they consulted with the community. So it's, uh, we are, I'm tr I've been trying to get our Inuit audience to keep listening and to voice their voice and to in remind them our voice matters, our voice is important, our 
observations are important. And um, I think for the first time in history, thank you, Minister of Indian Affairs, um, <laughs> we were listened to at the government level and the expansion request was denied and um, Inuit were celebrating. Some were a bit hurt saying, well, you can't just expect us to work at the Northern and Co-op. There are more jobs other than mine. There are jobs you can be in teacher, you can go further your education in the South. Yes, you have to leave home for a while, but you can always go back home. And I think that the government has to acknowledge and not only say, yes, we respect, we want to reconcile, we want to work together, but do the action, do the, do the work. If you have to translate the languages into the indigenous languages, and if they learn, if the youth will learn better in their own language, why not translate them? Well, there's not enough funding. Well, if you can fund so much money to outside of Canada, how come you're not putting funding to smaller communities in the indigenous people? In, in When I say indigenous people, the First Nations, the Inuit, the Métis. Thank you. Thank you. I got to say, this conversation, uh, it's mostly me asking questions. I really like it. <laughs> uh, but I have to say, uh, we're going to, I'm going to end with one question that I, I think it's very important in that conversation. I'm not going to open it to uh, question the public because we're going to be able to converse for real between the panelists and yourselves, guys. Uh, but what I want to ask, though, it's, it's from a perspective of, uh, of my own, because here in Montreal next week, we're celebrating the 10th anniversary of the Idle No More movement that happened here in across Canada. And at the time when we were doing this, it was on the, the tail of the student movement. Probably you heard about it. It's 2012. You can imagine we're seeing scenes of students uh, protesting in the streets to get a cheaper education, not the cheaper in the, the, the way, but it's more accessible. And they're getting beaten up by police. And we're coming in like in December 2012 and we're like, Okay, we're going to take the streets, but if they hit their own kids, what they're going to do to indigenous women, we're like, yeah, okay, let's do this, let's do this. Um, and the thing, <laughs> the thing is, though, is that it gave me a perspective on intergenerational uh, the, the, the relationship that are broken down in North American uh, communities. It was really about all oh, these damn kids. They go back to school, uh, stop protesting, and said, "Shut up, boomer!" And it was, and it was really like they were putting generation of people into uh, silos. And when we, and when they were protesting, that's what was happening. It was one generation telling the other, "Go back to school, stop protesting." But when we did idle no more and across Canada, what I saw is cookums in the streets, minus 20, walking with us, and the youth making sure the elders were listened to during these walks, and made sure that we, we, we put them forward and recognize the work they did for us in the generation before. And that's where I saw that vision, where the elders here are seen as a commodity and something that if they're not protected themselves by putting like uh, 401ks and money on their bank account, to make sure that they're not put in old people's home, uh, that made them have a vision of the future that's very individualistic. And for indigenous people, it's a promise between two generations that are connected. So it's the grandparents that say, I'm gonna make sure your kids and your grandkids have a future. And it's our generation saying, I'm going to make sure that the end of your life, you're going to be respected, listened to. You're going to get the best plates at the feast. That's the promise we made between our generation. So this conversation of intergenerational 
uh, relationship are very different in this perspective. So sadly, I'm gonna give it to the youngest generation on the panel, because <laughs> I wanna have your perspective, because you're gonna be the one that's gonna see the eighth generation from me. And I'm really hoping that you can help us find a, a, a path to be able to work between indigenous and non-indigenous, because I don't wanna leave my children to have to recreate these patterns uh, on, on their, when they're grown. So I, I was hoping to have your vision, Takaya, about how do you think we can manage for the eighth and ninth generation to be able to work and maybe not have to work to protect the territory. If we are lucky, they're gonna have it for the next one. For myself, I feel like every moment leading up to where I am right now has been my journey of finding my role as a young person in my community, where I fit in the necessary work to ensure the survival of our future generations and to protect the birthright that is our land. I fight for my nieces and my nephews and my little cousins and my great, great, great grandchildren. And I believe in our ability to outlive and to survive because every single apocalypse you can think of, indigenous people have already survived. And that is, that is the genocide. And Canada didn't account for us still being here, but we are. And there was flaws in their colonial strategy that we are answering for now because they did not think that we would still be here. They did not think that we would survive. As I mentioned earlier, these solutions that you keep asking indigenous people for our memories, their, their knowledge systems, their truths. And they're more simple than I think most people would like to accept. Colonialism has to end in order for future generations to survive. Capitalism has to end in order for future generations to survive. <laughs> when I fight for future generations, I am fighting for future generations of Tla'aman, future generations of Inuit, future generations of, of, of our people being able to survive and thrive and speak our languages. I am not fighting for future billionaires. Um, <laughs> Everything that we need to survive, we have within us already. We have the instructions. It is a matter of reawakening the teachings. And our land can offer us that survival. Some of our territories are more touched by extraction than others. And that's where we will need to see a more... Um, global or large-scale revival around our food systems because I know that when these colonial food systems come crashing down the colonial powers that be are not going to make sure to feed our people so we are going to have to rely on our lands and our land has always cared for us um, so we, we need to challenge systems of exploitation, systems of extraction that only benefit the few in order for the survival of the many, in order for the survival of our future generations. And it's going to be hard work because I do not think that colonialism can be salvaged. Um, I do not think that um, 
that in that my culture can survive while we are designated as a sacrifice zone for capitalism. Um, so I am, I don't have the, the solution for how that fits for non-Indigenous people, but as I said, I have had to find my role for, for my people um, and, and what I am responsible for in this lifetime, and I challenge you know, everyone um, of, of all ancestries in this room to find your role to recognize the truth that we do need the land um, and your future generations need this land and you need to stand alongside indigenous people for our collective future so find your role find what that means um, I can't I can't give you that answer but I can encourage you to fight harder thank you <laughs> well, Tagaya, thank you. That means I'm not out of a job yet. <laughs> but it's a good work. It's a good work. I think that's why we're, we're still here together, all assembled in this room. We want to find solution all together. And I want to ask Severn, before we get to, uh, to rub elbows, Severn, I look, I look like uh, the price is right right now. It's like, Severn! <laughs> Severn, I want to ask you, because you've seen the first COP and now you're at COP 15, do you have a couple of solutions that maybe we can, we can apply right now as what you've been, well, not really seeing lively uh, on the terrain, but I think you've seen enough to propose solutions that we could try to work around these times. Well, I think that we've heard some incredible solutions right here that I, I want the audience to really sit with. And to Kaya's challenge to the rest of us, for us non-Indigenous allies and settlers, is to, to really find our role. And truly, I think, you know, even though I look back on the past 30 years and I think of all the lost opportunities that we've had to stop climate change, to halt the biodiversity loss that we knew has been happening for, for many, many decades, I think now is a very particular moment. We now know what the solutions are. We have the solutions. We know what to do. The technologies are out there. We've studied the problems. You know, we, we have that research. And second, on the local level, even though on the national level, leadership is appalling, on the local level, in communities and municipalities, we're seeing those solutions actually happening. And once again, you know, across this country, we're seeing First Nations communities leading the way in terms of adapting, preparing for climate change, and also getting off of fossil fuels, also becoming more self-sufficient, growing foods, returning to traditional practices. So that actually is happening. And then the third piece that we can't deny that we actually have to make count is that We've just seen what, an, what a real emergency response actually looks like. We've just lived through it. And that was the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. We have just lived through a time where governments moved billions of dollars, where governments, par parties worked across party lines, where the politicians have paid attention to science, and where all of us completely changed our lives. and. You know, so when people say, well, we can't, you know, we can't transform our society, that's just not true. <laughs> and we've just seen that proof. So it's a matter of, of, of will and it's a matter of what all of us decide to invest in. I want to say, you know, and I, I think tonight's been really special. I think a huge amount of generosity is being offered by our Indigenous college colleagues here to, you know, keep working and keep on fighting for all of our great grandchildren but i want to say that i'm recommitting as an ally to decolonizing 
and to a future that is viable. And I hear you loud and clear, all of you panelists, you know, we have to look at the reality that it's not humanity that's destroying the earth. It is one mindset of humans that are destroying the earth, one dominant paradigm that has taken over all, that is eating our future. And this is the paradigm that has to end if we're gonna survive. It's the globalized par capitalist paradigm. It's removed all our accountability for how we treat the earth and how we treat each other. And there are so many examples of how to be different. Indigenous peoples oversee 20% of the planet's territories yet house 80% of the earth's biodiversity. I've heard that stat so many times at this conference. Well, that is evidence for land back. That is the argument. You know, that is, that is the future. So I'm actually going to give the last word to David, who is the elder of, of, uh, of this group. And, um, but I want to thank you all for, for this amazing evening and for sharing, sharing these teachings. I'm wondering whether uh, uh, Miles, as an elder, would have anything to say. <laughs> no, no. You have a... If not, I just wanted to give you, as an elder, uh, a chance. <laughs> ah, yeah. you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, my family doesn't agree with me about this, but I always raise the point about what the challenge is. Ever since we, uh, the Nature of Things did a program on the tar sands, way back in the 1990s, when Peter Lougheed was premier, they at that time were planning on 10 more syncrude sized plants. And that at that time was a lot of, uh, it was a lot of acid rain. And I went after uh, them about the issue of acid rain and these plants. Uh, anyway, so I've been fighting against the development of the tar sands for many years. And five years ago, I got a call from the CEO of one of the largest companies in the tar sands. Could I come and talk to you? Whoa, yeah, of course, anytime. I'm not into fighting. Come talk to me. Showed up the next day from Fort McMurray. I th thanked him profusely and said what an honor it was. But I said, I'd like you to come into my door and sit in my office and leave your identity as a CEO of an oil company outside. Because I don't see the point of talking about carbon emissions and carbon taxes and all of that until we start from a point of agreement. If we can't start with a point of agreement, then we're arguing all over the place and we're not speaking to each other. Now, he was a good man. He goes to church every Sunday. He loves his children. He goes camping. He was a good man. So he came in and I said, thank you for doing that. I know this isn't what you came to negotiate something, but I said, what do you think is the most important thing every human being on earth needs? And instead of giving me an answer, he went, well, and, and I could see he's thinking of job, money. I said, if you don't have air for three minutes, you're dead. If you have to breathe polluted air, you're sick. So would you agree with me that clean air, we don't make clean air, it's a gift from nature. Nature creates clean air. It's a sacred gift that we have a responsibility to protect that for the all generations to come. And then I said, you and I, we're 60 to 70% water by weight. We're just a big blob of water with enough thickener added. We don't dribble away on the floor. But, you know, this, we leak water out of our skin and our eyes and our mouth and our crotch. And we lose water <laughs> all the time. So if you don't have water for four to six days, you're dead. If you have to drink polluted water, you're sick. Water through the hydrologic cycle is cartwheeling around the planet. And life, the web of living things, filters that water so that we can drink it. Clean water is a gift from nature. And we have a sacred obligation to protect it. And then I said, you know, you and I, we're created by the carcasses of other species, of other animals and plants. We're created by 
our food, and most of it grows in the soil, which in turn is created by life. You know, on Mars, when Matt Damon was stranded on Mars, remember he had one year's worth of potatoes, but he had to wait four years to be rescued. There's a lot of dust and sand and clay there, but there was no soil. So he had to shit in the hole and then plant his potatoes. Life creates the soil on which we survive. And every bit of the energy that we need in our bodies to move and work and play and grow, all of that is sunlight captured by plants in photosynthesis. So it seems to me these four elements that indigenous people call earth, air, fire, and water, sacred gifts from nature, and all of the other living species cleanse, replenish, create the four sacred elements. Other things, capitalism, socialism, governments, religions, co uh, corporations, currency, markets, those are not forces of nature. We created them. We can't change the forces of nature, the laws that determine what we need to survive but we can certainly change the things that we create to conform to the laws of nature. I said, Mr. CEO, if you shake hands with me on that, I will do everything I can to help you and your company. And of course, that's a dilemma. He couldn't shake hands. If he were to go back to his shareholders and say, I had a talk with Suzuki, and he's right, whatever our company, an oil company does, we can mess with the air, the water, and the soil. He wouldn't be praised as a new green champion of the corporation. He'd be fired in a second because that's not his job. And this is the, the problem we face, that we have created these structures, legal, economic, and political, to govern us. But nature isn't a part of it. Nature should be the foundation of that. Everything we should do should be to protect those four critical elements and all of our relatives, the, the animals and plants that make the planet habitable for us. Now, I'm just giving you my an analysis. My family then says, yeah, but then what? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But it seems to me, if we don't start from that position, then it's all the stakeholders are fighting for their stakes. And uh, I've seen it happen over and over again. Pensima on the Pacific Coast. I've seen the uh, round tables that Bill Bennett set up to deal with the fo forest uh, battles. And um, it doesn't work that way because we don't start with a common understanding. And that common understanding is obviously what indigenous people have lived with and survived with for thousands of years. So I think the first thing we have to do is go and thank, thank indigenous people for hanging on despite everything that's been done to them to stamp it out and encourage them and support them so that we can then learn the lessons that we need in the dominant society. Ultimately, capitalism has got to be destroyed, obviously. Woo! David, Lucy, CP Flama. I want to say thank you also to everybody that is here tonight. Uh, and as Takaya said, uh, the solution is so simple. That's why it's so frightening to keep to take off the training wheels on reconciliation, on climate change, on protection of biodiversity. So tonight. I hope you're bringing back home for those who, uh, who want to have solution and suggestion for others uh, how to be there, there to make that change because it, it's that simple. It's so simple, it's, it's scaring. So, Chinese commitment, everybody, and stay. We will be here, and at 9 o'clock, I'm kicking you all out. <laughs>